Personally, I find fame confusing now it's such a growth industry. Increasingly, whatever you read, wherever you look, your attention is focused on celebrity. But we rarely get to see the real person until there's a crisis. I was interested in the idea of dealing with celebrity, but in a very intimate way. And that's how I got to meet the Spice Girls, because I'd sort of put that about, and then Virgin asked if I'd go and meet the Spice Girls, because they needed a filmmaking about them. And that's how I met Jerry. Molly, she came to visit the Spice Girls when we were on tour. And the initial idea was that she was going to make a documentary on all of us. And what happened was that I, I left the band and I, I really liked her kind of way. And she was, I could tell that she was very, how do you say, nitty gritty and very real. And there was no way that the Spice Girls as a band were going to let such a hardcore documentary maker come that close. It just wasn't going to happen. But it kind of suited me. <laughs> I also was a bit lonely at the time. This is how Jerry Halliwell told the world through her solicitor of her decision to leave the Spice Girls. I have no immediate plans. Every five minutes on the news there'd be another um, news flash saying where is Ginger Spice it was just so when she phoned up I was obviously thinking with a complete journalist hat on core blimey this is the inside story how interesting and therefore I went to meet her in France just to look into it although she'd hidden and was trying to get away from everything she'd taken her camera with her and her brother was filming her in a hotel in Paris Today is Thursday the 28th of May. I'm in Paris and um, yesterday I left the Spice Girls. Maybe it sounds a bit self-obsessed, but at the time I thought actually this is quite, maybe it's quite fascinating to see what happens with, a, you know, what happens when a girl who's so integrated in a band leaves it and what's going to happen to her. There's something quite cathartic about doing diaries, I think, and then it's a public diary. Okay, stopping now. Going from the Spice Girls to Molly was like doing a 360 turn because in the Spice Girls everything was very much contained and controlled by the image that we put out there. So for that reason I think Molly was almost like my escapism, my break free in certain ways. It was a challenge to somebody that wanted to control everything to let go. Initially we had that that discussion of discussion of, you know, the, 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 on the edit, you know, who is it, this is going to be a 50 50 thing? I've got complete control on it, and it'll be edited if there's anything, you know, bad in it, or, you know, then when it's really serious, we just they'll leave the room. Okay. Sorry, but I'm just listening to you then, and what you just said to him about this film being totally in your control. And I'm sitting here thinking, no, it's not. It is, though. I think. One of the problems of filming celebrity is that the business of being a celebrity is keeping alive a public image and letting people know how, how much you would like them to know of the truth. And it seems to me the job of journalists is to get to some mucky part of their lives and expose that. And I don't want to do that. And I want to put them through much more of a filter. And yet, ironically, the filter you hope is giving them the confidence to actually be who they are. And that's very hard if the business is selling an image. You know, if I'm just myself anyway, I'm not a horrible person. So hopefully, you know, people, you know, I'm daring to bear. I'm daring to do it. I'm daring to go there, trying to go there as best as I can. Yeah, but what a lot of people will question is why? Is it why? that you're an egomaniac? Or that you can't live without a camera? Why does there have to be a bad motive? Because it's very unusual, I suppose. What are the good motives behind it then? She says, but why should it be a negative reason? You know, why should people necessarily think it's a bad reason that I want to? And I don't answer, which I've always been amazed no one's picked up on, because I think that's very cowardly, because I make her answer my questions. But I get out of answering hers, which is, why is it necessarily bad to want to be seen on camera? 
as time grew on, I just learned to let go a little bit more, let go of control and trust, and also to allow, you know what, I'm not a perfect person. I've got flaws coming out of, you know, and also to show that at a very vulnerable time in my life. It was like going through a divorce, so I was all over the place. So to allow that, to trust her, to that, you know, she's not going to make me look too stupid, but just allow her to tell her story through her, her own eyes rather than mine. I do feel nervous. But, but I'd be nervous about today, too, if I was you. <laughs> no, but it's good, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but is this the first time you've been back in the public eye? Yeah. It is properly that of my instigation, I suppose. You know, I feel vulnerable. I'm not the same person as I was when... I think there's always a mixture of motivation in any, anything that we do in life. There's never a pure one. Of course there's ego, you know, show off, entertain oh, look at me, whatever. But equally, there's a part of me that believes, just through my own experience, when I've read books and I read a lot of books, when I've watched a lot of television, and I've watched a lot th through my childhood, those stories, other people's stories and other people's honesty have almost healed me and empowered me, inspired me, comforted me. And so I believe in my own admission of honesty, my own admission of errors and triumphs, that can actually give comfort to others. No, yeah, but this was like mostly her. It's like how the world knows her. Ginger is kind of a character that I based on, you know, my wild child days, really. I just brought her to life in my 20s. And it's kind of putting that to bed. bed. I could, you know, I could never go back there again. I was working on Jerry absolutely on my own for the first time, which was daft. Why do you stop doing portraits on my mother, please? Yeah. You stop it. She's not being in it. No, I'm not being in it. Hello? Yeah, I don't end up... So I had the camera with, I mean, nothing sophisticated, not even radio mics. I just had an onboard mic and my little, I don't know, VX1000, a little video camera. But I didn't have a sound recorder because I hadn't committed enough to have a schedule. And I was in mummy mode, which didn't go hand in hand with being in film mode. So I couldn't pay somebody to commit to what? occasional days here and there and I think the film really lost through that because I didn't know all these other things that were going on in her life and I certainly wouldn't have been able to clear them because that's a whole load more phone calls and schmoozings said, it literally would you know, be I'd phone her and say morning Jerry how are you and she'd say I'm doing so and so and I might say well can I come and film it or I'd already know from the day before but um it's not a good thing making films on your own Technically, it was weird, but also socially, emotionally, there was no one to share it with, and it was all happening between she and I. And I think that's a bit unhealthy for a film. Maybe where it paid off, though, is it made it a more intense film, that it is very much about her and she and I. What do you think? I think it's quite important to confront certain emotions and she's very direct with the camera. She's very honest a lot of the time, very vulnerable, um, obnoxious on occasions, and sweet. I mean, I just think she, because it's all about her, you probably get a much more complex portrait of her than, than had I got more of an infrastructure myself and shot all these other scenes. Because there is something, when she's sitting in the car, slumped, and she's just been written about horribly again, there's something very genuine in her gloom, her misery at that moment. And I think that that is her talking to her new friend. She was that when, when they called her old and fat and ugly, as they often did, would just come bouncing back with high hair and shorter skirt and more lipstick. Isn't that horrible? For that time, it was an intimacy that I suspect wouldn't have happened had I had somebody in the car with a mic, or had she been radio mic'd up, or had we been filming all sorts of other things. It's funny that my life is just a media circus. You know, I'm just hanging... It's in case someone shoots their big lens as I go to the toilet. Um, 
What I keep trying to touch on is what it is about you that still so wants fame. Because when you talk about it, you know the downsides, the loneliness that it's brought you and all that, and yet emotionally you're still completely caught up in it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I can't help emotionally reacting to that. Who wouldn't? I think I thought I was making a film about being in the bubble of celebrity, in the vacuous, the often vacuous bubble which is so huge when you're outside it. And I think when you're inside it, you feel like everyone else. Um, <clears throat> but with more assistance, more new shopping and much more loneliness. Because you can't mix normally. She didn't have lots of celebrity friends, but nor could she have lots of normal friends. So she was falling between stools. And for that difficult period, as she says at the end, I was her friend. You know, everything's going right. But then... You know, and I was thinking, oh, maybe I haven't got any friends. Is that what it is? You know, and I have got some really nice friends. You know, about, about three, four, I don't know. As a filmmaker, I think she's always looking for the... She's looking for truth, the humanity in it, the, the, the conflict, the inner conflict. That's the story of the, the emotional struggle rather than the external struggle. She looks for the internal struggle. Every weekend I start crying. <laughs> Would you describe it as a void? I don't know. I think everyone's got a void to a degree if we really sit down. I put on a lot of masks to be in the world. Well, they, were, they were authentic masks, they are part of me, but I wanted to peel them off, I wanted to grow. And I, and I naturally felt Molly was part of that process of really having the courage to grow, looking back. Um, I couldn't articulate that then. Um, and then I actually just liked her. I thought she was really nice and she was so smart. She was making me question things and sti stimulate thought processes of how I see the world. I was thirsty for that kind of intellectual stimulation. The average person doesn't have a clue right, what's yeah. going on. They read the, you know, they read the sun, they don't really know what's going on in Afghanistan or Uganda. They've got no idea. But then it's very attractive about her. She's incredibly interested in the outside world. In fact, she should make documentaries, probably. She's very curious, and we had a very good friendship. It's, don't you find the biggest nightmare is you're having to tread so carefully? Yeah, absolutely. All these people that could take offence. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to say, well, actually, you know, it's down to the individual woman. Do you think the fact you're no longer part of the group limits your ability to propagate the message of the population fund? Well, I think, at the end of the day, I am famous, OK? Mm -hmm. Lots of people know who I am, and I am damn well going to use my fame positively. You know, to me, the I best people to film are people who don't watch telly. They've got no sense of the stage. I mean, Hilary Hook was great from that point of view. I hadn't seen telly maybe for 40 years. Oh, God, it must have still been black and white and just one channel when he last saw it. No, he made trips to England. He would be vaguely aware of it. Um, Jerry lived entirely in a media spotlight. So I had to somewhere be on the edge of the spotlight. And then there's the problem when you get too much in it, you're going to destroy that focus for her. If you're outside with everyone else, you're never going to be able to see her. It's a very difficult bit of territory, which is why I used to always try and opt for the home with the wonderful mother. Oh, Anna, who was great. Because that was a way of Jerry being with somebody and us getting a more honest feel of what she's actually like and where she's from. And because you're permanently treated as a piece of litter when you're part of the entourage, you just have to stick very close to the gold dust so that you don't get binned or chucked out. And you're always fighting other news crews or camera crews for position. It, I mean, I, the scene in Bond Street when she's auctioned off her dress and the, the paparazzi are chasing her, but the, the indifference is I'm trying to stay ahead of the pack because I can't be lost. And what's more, they have to be my subject as well as her. So it's great that that works. And I just clung on to her. Um, and they're rather glorious moments too. You can see why people like hanging around with famous people, which is that then when you get ushered through and you find these spaces made for you and you can squeeze into the car with her. Those are wonderful moments. When she gets in the car and everyone's clamoring and she's going, that's a lovely moment to share. That's the kind of thing you earn by sticking around with somebody. 
What did you think of the finished film? How did you... It's very painful it? watching it because it's very hard. I haven't watched it back for years, actually, but it was very close to a time. I would say when I left the Spice Girls, it was probably one of the most painful times in my life because my father had died just before the Spice Girls and I had not processed that at all. I'd gone into overdrive of, you know, of workaholism, just work head down. I, you know, I had a raging eating disorder. You know, I was just full in, you know, avoidance of myself during the Spice Girls. You know, I was determined, militant, because, you know, I was burying so much pain. And to come out of that, I was heart, completely heartbroken you know, of coming out the Spice Girls because I, I was really disappointed to leave that, but I was trying to find some power. I was trying to, f to find my confidence again because they, they were my, everything to me, these girls. And for me, I didn't have the tools to, to like in a marriage, did not have the tools or the maturity to negotiate, to work things through. Instead, I run away. I just thought, I can't do this anymore I'm leaving and so to try and heal that and find some take responsibility for it watching a film back uh, is it, quite painful to look at that in fact she cried when she saw it and I said what are you crying about I really panicked it was quite it was in a rough state um and she just said I feel so sorry for me You know, sometimes I think people use sad events in their life and they're crying about something completely different. I was very, very conscious at the time of what the Spice Girls would think of it, but they, they, they never commented on it. She's an entertainer, she's, super, she's in the star, but... Don't say, I don't like it when you say things oh, like sorry, that. Oh, sorry, I'm a star, because then you sound like a... Superstar then? No, no. I, mean, I think my mum came out of it, the star. <laughs> my mum's brilliant, so, you know, the she, she's such a character. She is who she is. She's very, she is, she, she's very authentic. And um, I think you just scenes in that, you know, when she says about the, um, my new house. It's very big. Very big. <laughs> what do you Too think? big. Yes, very big. Very big. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to look so small inside. You're going to get lost, dear. Yeah. I don't regret making that film at all. I'm really proud of the film that Molly made of me um, because I think it was the first of its kind when, you know, a famous person really had the courage to, you know, say this is how it is and this is how it is at a really tricky time in my life. So I'm really pleased that I did that. And also the feedback I've always got has been very, very positive. So I was like, okay, great. Um, and also getting to know Molly. I'm still friends with her. You know, I'm interested in her life, in her children. She's a lovely person. She's really kind and funny. Um, so you know, I got a great friend out of it. So, you know, it was, it was a, a win-win situation. Do you think you would appear in a similar documentary today? If Molly asked me to do a documentary, I'd definitely consider it because there's something nice and, and there's a trust there. And I really admire her as, a, as an artist, you know, as a, as a storyteller, as a communicator. Once you learn to understand Molly, you know, in her technique and the, the effort and the, the thought that goes behind it, you say, wow. She's not just sticking a camera there. Just film that oh, with one hand, but give me your brain. You don't need your brain to the minute while you're filming, do you? <laughs> I think, oh, so that's really probably the end of my career. <laughs> I think going down a route with somebody else wouldn't. And also, it is. I so feel much... like I was cheating on her. <laughs> <laughs>